Good morning. We've been talking about the book of Hebrews, written to Jewish people who were in danger of backsliding back into Judaism to flee from persecution. Chapter 1 and 2 spoke of Christ's superiority to the angels. In chapter 2, we saw for a little while he was made a little lower than the angels in humanity. He gave himself for us. In 3 and 4, down through 4.13, he will show Christ's superiority over Moses and his system, this, the mosaical order. Why does he need to show he's superior to Moses when he's already shown he's superior to angels? Well, according to rabbinical teaching, Moses was equal to the angels. Not only that, if he is to replace the law of Moses, he needs to show Christ's superiority over the lawgiver. And he'll show that by starting out showing the parallels between Christ and Moses, their equality. Then he will show the contrast between Moses and our Lord Jesus. Both these men brought about a great exodus. Moses brought about an exodus out of the land of Egypt where they were in bondage to Egypt, bondage to Pharaoh, and their goal, uh, the promised land, was in Canaan. Jesus brings about a great exodus. But his exodus is not from Pharaoh and Egypt. His exodus is a spiritual exodus and frees us from the bondage of Satan and sin. And the result and the goal of the land of promise to us is heaven and eternal life with Jesus. He talks about, I need to look at that because a couple of Wednesday nights ago I didn't look at that and never did show up there. It just showed on my computer. Verses 1 through 6. He will show Moses physical and Christ spiritual exodus. He says in these verses, he says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of your calling, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as was Moses in all his house. <coughs> For he was counted worthy of greater glory, as the one that built the house is of more honor than the house. Every house is built by someone, which it says right over there. But the builder of all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, as a testimony for the things which were asked afterwards to be spoken. But Christ as a son over his house whose house we are if we hold fast our boldness and the glory of our hope firm unto the end. He begins by speaking and calling us holy brethren. We talked about that the last time that I spoke in chapter 2. We see that it's because of Christ that we can be holy brethren. It says in verse 9, but we behold him who is made a little lower than the angels, even Christ, because of suffering death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he should taste of death for every man. For it behooved him, of whom are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifieth and those that are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call us brethren. He that sanctifieth is Jesus. Those that are sanctified are we. And in God's sight we're all of one. Jesus and we Christians are all one. We're holy. And because of that we can stand before Jesus. And he says we're partakers of a heavenly calling. 
That's the beginning of our exodus. We see in Luke 9, Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he's talking with Elijah and Moses. And it says there in verse 31, speaking of his decease, which he should soon accomplish in Jerusalem. Speaking of his decease. Now the word for decease, my margin says, depart. The word deceit there is exodus. The word for exodus. They were talking about Jesus' exodus, which he accomplished at the cross where he went and he has become the counterpart then of the Hebrew Passover lamb. After the ten plagues, or after the nine plagues, the tenth one coming up in Exodus 12, God told the Hebrew nation to take, through Moses, to take a lamb and slaughter the lamb and take the blood on hyssop and put it on the doorpost of the doors. And God said in verse 12, when he goes to the land of Egypt in the night, he will smite all the firstborn, the cattle and the men and their gods. In verse 13 he says, and the blood shall be a token to your houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. (coughs) Jesus becomes the Passover lamb. Calvary is the slaughter of Christ. He is the Christian sacrifice. The mosaical sacrifice. The mosaical exodus sacrifice was a lamb. The Christian sacrifice is the son of God. He gave his life for us. His blood is sprinkled at the doorpost of our hearts. And it is the freedom from bondage and sin. It is the blood of the door of our heart which Jesus shed so that God will pass over us. But Jesus is not only the Passover... He's also the apostle and high priest of our confession. Jesus is the one that we confessed. Now both Jesus and Moses were apostles by the meaning of the word apostle. Apostle means one sent with a mission. Moses was sent with a mission. Jesus was sent with a mission. But Christ is unique in the fact that he is a high priest also, and that is the confession that we confess. He is unique there. In chapter uh, 3, verse 2, then he says, who, speaking of Jesus, who is our apostle and high priest, who is faithful to him that appointed him, as also was Moses in all of his house. Now Jesus was faithful. Chapter 2, verse 17 tells us it behooved him, speaking of Jesus, to be made like unto his brethren in all points, that he might become the merciful and faithful high priest in God, uh, unto God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus was faithful, and it says in that same verse, as was also Moses in all of his house. Now he gets that, and he speaks from Numbers 12. In Numbers 12, we see that Miriam and Aaron were in rebellion, maybe a little rebellion, but in a rebellion to Moses. He had married a Cushite woman. Now what happened to Sephora, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say whether he died or whether he just took on a second wife. I don't know. But he married a Cushite woman. And Aaron and Miriam came and told Moses that God didn't only speak through you. He spoke through us also. So God appears in verse 6 and he says, if there be a prophet among you, I'll make myself known in visions and I'll speak to him in dreams. But But with Moses it is not so, for he is faithful in all my house and I will speak to him mouth to mouth. Jesus was faithful the one that appointed him. Moses was faithful to the one that appointed him. We see that in this we have a 
a parallel. Moses appointed by God. Jesus appointed by God. Moses was faithful. Jesus was faithful. Moses was sent by God. Jesus was sent by God. Moses was, in, was sent in relation to God's house. Jesus was sent in relation to God's house. Moses was a spokesman for God. And Jesus was a spokesman for God. Now in verse 3, he'll start speaking of a contrast. They are parallel. He has no problem in praising Moses. He doesn't speak downwards. He doesn't uh, speak as Moses being inferior. The higher he raises Moses, the more superior Jesus is. So he says in verse 3, for he was counted worthy. The he there is Jesus. He was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. By as much as he that built the house has more honor than the house. Now the house we're talking about is the nation of Israel. Moses was speaking, uh, as far as most concerned, speaking of the house of Israel. And we'll see Jesus was the builder of the house. And Moses was a servant in the house. Jesus was faithful. Moses was faithful. But there's a great difference in who is more worthy of glory. Because Jesus built the house. In verse 4. It tells us clearly that Jesus is God. That's the verse that's over here on the wall. For every house has a builder, and he that built all things is God. Now that God is Jesus, because in the verse before, he just spoke of Jesus as the builder of the house. He's showing that Jesus is superior to Moses in the fact that Jesus is God and Moses is mere man. He built the house. In John 1, verse 3, tells us, speaking of the Word of God, who was God in verse 1, says in verse 3, All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that hath been made. Jesus is the builder of the house. He built the house of Israel. In verse 5, it tells us that Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant. He was faithful in the house, not over the house. Moses was in the house, and he was in the house as a servant. Now the word servant here is used one time in the Bible. It's not the regular word for service or servant. It's not the diakonos. This word is the therapon. The verb of that is therapuo, from which the word we get therapy. So it speaks of a servant, but it speaks of a healing servant. W. E. Vine, in his expository dictionary, says it means to serve, to heal. It is a servant with dignity. Gerald Payton says, it is a skilled servant of a surgeon, his assistant in surgeon. Jesus was there, excuse me, Moses was there, and God gave the law through Moses, but it was in his service to the Israelite nation, it was also in the healing of them. And that is the position which Moses took. And we see then in the latter part of that verse, it says that he was that this was for a testimony. He was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony. That's the reason he, he brought this up and bring up Moses and all of his faithfulness. That was all a testimony for the things which should afterwards be spoken. Moses spoke of Jesus. Even in all his, his exodus, all of the laws he gave while they were in the wilderness, and all this nation that Jesus built, that Moses was a servant in, Moses did all that as a testimony 
to the coming of Jesus. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, Moses says, Jehovah your God shall raise up a prophet unto you, like unto me, to him you shall hearken in all things. And in verse 18, where it's, it's Jehovah speaking to Moses, Jehovah says, I will raise up a prophet from amongst you, like unto you, I'll put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to the person, the peoples, all that I command. So Moses was a testimony to Jesus. But in verse 6, it tells us two great truths of the superiority of Jesus. He speaks of Moses in verse 5. He was faithful in all his house. But Christ, as a son, not as a servant, in the house. Christ is a son, not a servant. And he is over the house, not in the house. It's a, a whole difference. Jesus isn't in this house which he built. He's over the house. Moses is in the house as a servant. Jesus is over the house as the builder of the house and the savior of the body. He purchased and built this house with his own blood. The people in Jesus' house are believers, such as you and I. These are the ones in verse 1 that are partakers of the heavenly calling. But notice what he says then. Whose house we are, if, if we hold fast our boldness and the glory of our hope firm unto the end, to the doctrine of eternal security, once saved, always saved, will have a great problem with this verse. He will say three times, three different passages in this passage that shows the falseness of that, of that teaching. These people are in Christ. And he says they'll stay in Christ. They will be in the house of Christ if they hold fast their boldness and the, the glory of their hope firm unto the end. Boldness is a word that's common in the book of Hebrews. It speaks of their confidence, their courage. They receive that, that confidence and courage. We receive that boldness because of our access to the throne of God. We are nothing in ourselves. All of our boldness, all of our strength is because you and I can go before the throne of God and speak to God face to face, just like Moses did. He says in chapter 4, using the same word as he used for boldness here. Chapter 4, verse 15, we see that we have not a high priest that's not touched by the feeling of our infirmities, but one that's been tempted in all ways, like as we, yet without sin. Let us therefore... Draw near with boldness to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in time of need. He says in chapter 10 of Hebrews, verse 19, he says, having therefore boldness to enter into the holy place through the blood of Christ, who dedicated a way for us, the new and the living way, through the veil that is his flesh. Because of Jesus and because of what we already said in chapter 2, verse uh, 11. He that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all of one. Therefore, he is not ashamed to call us brethren. We have the privilege of standing before God. Going into the holy of holies. Which is now in heaven itself. When we pray, we stand right before God. And we have that privilege because we have Christ's holiness. We are holy in the sight of God. We are as holy in the sight of God as Jesus is if we're hidden in Jesus. That's where we get our boldness. We'll see great contrast now in verse 3 and following. Moses was a servant. Christ was a son. Moses is in God's house. Jesus Christ is over God's house. 
Moses was simple man. Jesus is eternal God. Moses witnessed to Christ. Christ had Moses' witness. Moses began a physical exodus. Jesus began a spiritual exodus. Moses led an exodus and with an earthly reward. Jesus leads an exodus with an eternal heavenly reward that will last for an eternity. Now after he says this, after he brings up the fact, if you hold your fast, your boldness, firm unto the end, you are in that house. If you don't hold that boldness and the glory of our confidence firm unto the end, then we're not staying in that house. And when he said this, then he brings up a psalm. It says, even as the Holy Spirit saith, today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. Like as in the day when they tempted me in the wilderness, where your fathers tempted me by proving me and saw my works for 40 years. And I was displeased with this generation, saying, they do always err in their hearts and they know not my ways. As I swear unto them, they shall not enter into my rest. The writer of Hebrews takes a passage that David wrote in Psalms 95, verse 7 through 11. Speaking of a, the exodus that Moses went. And the fact that they couldn't enter into God's rest because they didn't follow God. Now Moses, or excuse me, David speaks of this. And they're already in the promised land. But David uses that same example to speak to his people using that example because even though they're in the promised land, if they don't obey the Lord of God, they'll lose that. It was, a, it was necessary to serve God to retain in the land, to maintain their life in the God. Not only that, he's speaking of their eternal life. They're in danger of losing their eternal life. So then in the last few verses here, he brings it to, the, to its application. After he says, as he swear in his wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren. Verse 12. Take heed, brethren. There's something dangerous. Just like Moses' people. The exodus Moses led out was not able to enter into God's rest, the land of Canaan. Of all the men that were 20 years and older, they all died in the wilderness. Except for two, Joshua and Caleb. All the rest of them died in the wilderness because they didn't obey God. They tried Him. They proved Him. They saw His works for 40 years. But they erred in their heart. They didn't know God's ways. And that brings God's wrath and they wouldn't enter into His rest. Take heed, brethren, Lest happily there be any one of you that has an evil heart of unbelief in falling away from the living God. But exhort one another day by day so long as it is called today. Lest there be any one of you hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we are become partakers of Christ if, again, huh? If we hold fast the beginning of our confidence firm unto the end. Great warning. Warning from Moses in that exodus. Warning from David when he is trying to get his people to be obedient to God. Warning to the, to the Jews here 
In this, he makes three generations that's in a great danger. You can add ours to it. That'd make four. Three generations. Moses' generation. Moses' generation didn't enter into God's rest. David's generation from Psalms 95 also were in danger of falling back just like Moses' people were. Now he's telling the Hebrew people that got this letter that they too are in danger of losing their salvation and falling away from the living God. That living God's Jesus. Because that's what they're in danger of doing. They're going to leave Jesus and go back to Judaism. Three generations. You can make it even after that. He spoke to that generation in chapter 4, verse 7. He will again say, Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. For if Joshua, who led the people into the promised land after Moses died on Mount Carmel, for if Joshua had given them rest, he would have not spoken of another day. But there remaineth a Sabbath rest for God's people. The rest is still open. That's the reason he says today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. The living God Jesus Christ is not only the living God, He is the life-giving God. And without Jesus, you'll have no life. He says, lest happily there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief. Uh, of unbelief. It is evil to not believe in Jesus. You don't have to be a murderer, an adulterer, a thief or a liar to be evil. People that don't believe in Jesus, God says, are evil. God gave more than ample evidence to prove that who He is and who the Lord Jesus is and those that don't recognize that, God says, are evil people. Romans 1.20 for the invisible things of His from the creation are clearly seen, being perceived through the things that are made, even His everlasting power and divinity, that they may be without excuse. All the religions of the world are evil. Atheism, agnosticism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Shintoism, Jews, Muslims, whatever religion it is, if they don't believe in Jesus, God says they're evil. They have an evil heart of unbelief. To not believe in Jesus is a deliberate act that will bring the wrath of God upon them. We need to be diligent to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to hear of the Lord Jesus that can save them from that wrath. Amen. Our Lord Jesus brought up about the greatest exodus in the world. An exodus that just makes, that makes the exodus of Moses pale. Jesus removes us out of all the bondage that Satan has bound us in. He removes us from the bondage of sin. He washes us with His blood and makes us before God holy as Jesus is. Our promised land is heaven. We will live there eternally. An evil heart of unbelief. So he says in verse 12, I'm past that, aren't I? An evil heart of unbelief? Pass there. Not keeping up with my thumb, with my mouth, huh? In verse 13, 
He still he shows the need. But why does he start that verse with that, that verse with but? Lest there be any man, anyone with an evil heart of unbelief and falling away from the living God. But exhort one another day by day, so long as it is called today. Lest there be any one of you hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The need is for mutual encouragement day by day to hold the faith in Christ. We need more than Sunday morning's assembly to hold the faith strong. We need our brethren day by day. In the class today, we're going to talk about small groups, which supplies, which will supply this need. Today, so long as it is called today, today is the present time. We have no promise of tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day for anyone that hasn't come to Christ to come to Christ. Apart from me, there's no salvation, Jesus says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. Today is the day of repentance for any that has slipped away from Christ. Today is the day to come back from all of our laxness in our service to God. Lest there be any one of you hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. He makes, if you look at verse 12 or 13, an evil heart of unbelief, falling away from the living God. The opposite of that is exhorting one another day by day. And the end of that verse, we exhort one another day by day, lest we be hardened. People think that they can stand. We think we're strong in Christ. The only way we're strong in Christ is how strong we are in Christ. Because Christ is our strength. Let him that think he standeth take heed lest he fall. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. We need one another day by day, exhorting one another day by day, lest we be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Hardened. There is from the word, the original word is uh, skleruo, from which we get skleruo. Sclerosis. What's sclerosis? It's abnormal hardening of tissue. We talk of hardening of the arteries. That's sclerosis. But God is talking about the heart. If we don't have the exhortation from the brethren day by day, then our hearts get hardened. And they get hardened any time we subject ourselves to sin, our heart is hardened. Sin is deceitful. We think we can get away with this little one. It's hardening the heart. That verse again tells you that the doctrine of security is a false doctrine. Because he says these people that are Christ's people can have their hearts hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Then he says in verse 14, Again, he says, for we are become partakers of Christ. Christ is the one that sanctified us to 11. Christ calls us brothers. Christ opened the, the, the veil into the holy place, the holy of holies. We are partakers of Christ. As long as Christ lives before God, we'll live before God. That'll be eternity. If, again, huh? If 
You hold fast the beginning of your confidence firm unto the end. These people were in grave danger of not holding the beginning of their confidence firm unto the end. Many of us can also be in that great danger of not holding our confidence firm unto the end. He ends this talk before he goes back to the Israelites in verse 15 by saying again, it is said, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. Today, if you hear his voice. Today, if you're not in Christ. Today, if you've drifted away from Christ. Today is the only day you're sure of that you can, that you can have your salvation. If anybody is outside of Christ. If anybody has fallen away from Christ. Today is the day of your salvation. Come now while we stand and sing. Is the grandest scene.